hour and a half, two hour sessions, full contact, fitness. He put Cross in hospital. Did he? Yeah, heat stroke. But that was his whole thing. And we did it for days and days and days on heat. Like we did like 30 days nonstop. It just wore blokes, blokes down. We used to play this game called Beat the Box, and it was just constant, like playing a game, but you, the ball wasn't allowed to go out. You know, we didn't want any set piece. We mm. wanted to run them off their feet and yeah. just and run and run and run. And Eddie had said before, like, the closer it is for the longer it is, the better chance we'll have because they start thinking. They stop playing and they start thinking that, that we should be in front more. Brownie's one of those guys. He relates really well to the team and the players. And, and so he made us believe that the game plan we were going to do was going to work. And then Jamie had this whole thing about the physicality. To be able to compete, we had to be physical. So we'd done an enormous amount of physical contact training to actually feel it on the field in that, in that island game. That motivated us so much. All right, guys, welcome back to Shinjuku and a big welcome to Luke Thompson. Thanks for coming along today. No, thanks for having me. The Wait. Kintetsu legend himself. <laughs> royalty, royalty at the club. Is that how you guys know each other, Will? Yeah, I mean, I, I first met him when I come over here um, at the end of the Rugby World Cup 2019, and he'd obviously played in that as well. But, um, yeah, we first met there, and he's just always been someone who's been so welcoming and kind and made sure that us foreigners, when we came in, um, we were as settled as we, as we possibly could be. You had one game against Japan in 2007, yep. which I think you would have been in the squad I was then. In the squad didn't play that, yeah. that game, yeah. So let's jump to the start of your career, Tom, and go back to, obviously, you're from New Zealand, born and raised in Christchurch, I yep. think. Canterbury boy, born and bred. Yeah, yep. and you made the pretty early decision in your career to head over here. Yeah, so I was, I was just sort of cracked it into the Canterbury team, but, you know, they were pretty stacked, you know, Brad Thorne and Reuben Thorne and Norm Maxwell and... So the locks were pretty, yeah, there was a heap, heap of them. Yeah. And uh, so they were coming back from the All Blacks. So I was dropping out of the, the NPC side as it was at the time. And uh, Canterbury had a relationship with Sanyo, which is now Panasonic. And they said, well, do you want to go over there, do a year or two as a sort of professional sort of training and, and you know, sort of build up and, and train as a professional, play as a professional and, and then come back? And I said, yeah, why not? Give it a give it a go, bit of money, and you know, doing that lifestyle, and you know, that's sort of how I come over, and you never never went home. Yeah. And did they uh, did they try and get you back? Say like, well, what's going on here? You've not come back. They did, and they didn't, because they have so you know, Canterbury had so many players. You know, I could have gone back, and they said, you know, are you going to come back? And but they couldn't offer me a, a full time gig or anything like that. So. In my mind, it sort of felt like a step backwards yep. at the time. What was that like coming over at such a young age, like the, in, in at, that, at that time? Like, for example, a lot of us guys come over now, there's a lot more foreign influence, a lot more foreign players. The clubs are, I guess, a little bit more professional. But that was a long time ago. Mm. What was that like as a young young guy coming over? Long time ago, making me feel really yeah, old. Yeah. <laughs> you how, how old were you at the time? I was 20. I think i just turned 22. Wow. And so I came over um, and we had – well, the first thing you noticed was – the lack of foreigners compared to now. So there was five, five foreigners in a squad, two could play, and there was barely any boys with passports or anything like that. So, you know, you'd have two on the field at a time. That was that was basically it. Mm. But those boys became your family. Like that was they were real tight. Whereas now you go into squads and and there's you know there's 20, 25 foreigners in a squad. You don't actually have to uh, engage in the Japanese culture as much if you don't want to mm. because you you can just hang out with the foreigners and you don't even have to speak Japanese or whatever so um, in that sense it was it was a real immersion sort of sort of effect and also because I was quite young um, you know some of the guys were older but the Japanese boys were em embraced you a lot more too so you know the young guys you go out with the young Japanese boys and 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 that's how I sort of learned Japanese was you know at the at bars or at restaurants and stuff you know Doing it that way. Who were the around that time? You say there weren't too many foreigners. Were there any real big names that had made the decision to come over to Japan at that point? Who would have been the biggest ones? Oh, so in our team, Brownie. Tony, oh, yeah. So Tony Brownie, Brownie yeah. arrived at the same time. Yeah. Brownie was amazing for me. He taught me how to be a professional. Like I was living in this wee box that was probably, you know, four meters by four meters. It was like a wee. Have you, I don't know if you boys have been to the the, the young boys have live in the dorms. Oh, yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah, I was yeah, living yeah. basically in a, in a dorm, but it had pretty a kitchen ordinary, there. Pretty ordinary, aren't Yeah, it? and there was a wee shelf above the kitchen and stuff that was my bed. So I'd climb up this wee ladder and slide it. I couldn't <laughs> sit up or I'd hit my head on the roof. So that was the that was the starting first year. 
but Brownie would, you know, he knew I was living there, say, come on, come around. And we would just sort of half live at his house, um, watch TV, eat lunch, and then, you know, we'd go to training. And, yeah, he just basically took me under his wing and, and you know, showed me how to be a professional rugby mm. player. It was, it was pretty amazing. But even those living conditions, was there, was there ever a moment where you've just gone, this just, this is too strange, this is, uh, you know, like, or you just fully embraced it and you've loved it from the start to... Obviously, twenty years later. Oh, mate, there's obviously frustrations. You know, you know yourself. Like it, Japan has those amazing moments. You know, these amazing things that you know just make it such a special time. But then there's also the the frustrations. And, and mm. but you know, I was taken care of so you know so well. Yeah. You know, and you're earning money. Like earning, you know, for a 21 year old, 22 year old, earning good money. Yeah. You know, it was. It's, when I look back, it's <laughs> it's it was pittance, but but it was <laughs> yeah. at the time it was awesome. You know, and yeah. so. And you, you could save it all because you know you you know, package looked after your rent and all that sort of stuff. So um, I I was just you know thrilled to be there. Mm. Um, but you know there is the tough things. You know single you know away from your family. My partner at the time she was still in New Zealand for the first two years finishing uni, and so it was there was so it was some tough parts. But it was it was pretty pretty cool, like, mm. pretty enjoyable. Because it was only a one or two year deal to begin with. I guess you always had that intention of going home. At what point did that kind of change for you when you started to think this could be a long-term thing? Um, I played uh, some not bad footy in that first year and got a got a few cracks. And then the second year, played a wee bit, but not as much. They because um, you could only have two, so they had we had Sammy Vahafala. I don't know if you remember Big Sammy played Tonga. He's like a number eight. He dominated, and and so they started him in the forwards, and then. Brownie started playing more in the second year in the back, so we didn't get as many opportunities. Yeah. So they let me go after the second year. But um, I'd picked up an agent, and he sort of said, well, there's a few opportunities out there if you want to stay. Like, teams have seen you play, and they're, they're sort of keen. So, yeah, that was sort of at that point where, you know, I couldn't – there was no offer to go back to yeah. to Christchurch on anything. Decent. Yeah, decent, yeah. specific mm. or anything. So they said, you come back and you can have a go, and you know, sort of, well, that – Compared to over here playing and having a package, you know, it sort of was pretty easy to make that decision. When you're such a young guy coming over here, um, I mean, it's a tough, it's a tough place to adjust to. But do you remember sort of those first days or weeks? Just any sort of real moments? I remember um, driving. We were driving from the airport out, and I just couldn't believe the amount of concrete. You know, the, the <laughs> yeah. concrete the, jungle. Oh, and the and the roads up high off the off the ground. You know, yeah. like the highways. You know. And then the power lines when we got to Gumra. I don't know if you've, you you look in sort of sort of real housing sort of areas, and you see the power lines, and it's just like thirty or forty wires going along the road. And you just think, holy hell, who where are these wires going? That doesn't look safe. Or you know, compared to back home, it's just what one wire. Yeah, going through like that. Simple things, but that sort of just blew my mind at the time. Mm. You obviously had your years with Sanya Panner, and then you made the move south to Osaka. Yeah. Went down to Osaka in 06 and did 14, 14 years down, down in Osaka. Yeah. And then he goes to Osaka. She obviously enjoyed it down here then. Loved it. You, you know, it's it's a pretty awesome place to live. And Yeah, Osaka's great. I mean, Tokyo is a beautiful place to, to come visit and I guess to live as well. But Osaka is a little bit more laid back. I find people are a little bit more relaxed and it's just less busy. Yep, 100%. And where we, where we had a great setup, you know, the stadium was, you know, 10-minute bike away. And then the train stations are handy, and the, and the, the mountains just behind. Mm-hmm. If you want to get into the green, you know, get out, get out of the city. You, you know, fifteen minute bike ride, and you're in, in sort of you know, a bit of bush and stuff. So, it's a pretty, uh, it's pretty special in that sense. Yeah, and you talked a little bit about the foreigners. But what was the standard like of the league at the time? I remember thinking that it was the fastest rugby I've ever played. Mm-hmm. You know, it was like, it was almost like a, a game of physical touch, you know, like it would just be, you, you, you couldn't go try and go to every ruck because it was just happening so quickly. Um, and so that was, it was, and people think, oh, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't many hits, but there was probably more hits. If that, yeah. if that makes sense. So yeah. you, yeah. You, you might do, you might do 50 clean outs because, you know, the game had that many rucks, but they weren't massive big hits and stuff. So in that sense, it was just really fast and really, um, and and the other thing you remember is trainings were just so long. You know, three hour trainings is just a, was a standard. Mm. More. So you, you would have seen a massive shift now, not mm. just obviously the the quality of foreigners that are coming over, but even like the quality of the competition, training, preparation, all that type of stuff. When did you notice a real 
huge, you know, that that big shift where it's it was professional then, but like it's almost now like it's it's a super rugby yeah. run program, you know. They're all pretty much all the teams now are, are at that super sort of and because a lot of the coaches are super super rugby or, you know, professional come from professional big environments, so um, I don't know if I could think of a, a one single time mother, jump, yeah, yeah. but it's, it's just a gradual thing. Yeah, you know, like it's you know you you see more and more uh, foreign coaches, and then they bring in foreign trainers. Mm. And not to say the Japanese aren't good, but you know they they bring a new set of ideas and new techniques and what's been used, say in say Australia or New Zealand or South Africa or you know UK and stuff. So they bring those ideas in and. and you know, they say, well, start getting, well, shorter might be better, but we do want to do it more intense. And then I think when Japan started having a bit more success, yep. then the people started looking at what Japan was doing, you know, what, what Eddie did. So around that, that 2015, I think, and slightly before that, um, there was a real shift in the way a lot of the teams were training. You obviously have a lot of quality foreign players coming through, but you've also, as you've stated before, quality coaches, foreign coaches coming through. Who do you reckon has more of an influence on changing that culture? Is it a combination of both or more the coaches because they can then implement the new ideas, the new ways of doing things? Probably a combination of both. Mm. And But a, I think a coach can have real influence. You look at your Eddie Joneses or your, you know, Jamie's or uh, Robbie at you know, Panasonic. Um, you know, some of those guys have really changed the whole program and been able to, you know, right down to recruitment and to, to how you do things. It's quite a challenge. Like, oh, you, I don't know what you think as well from your experience, but like, like we were, we been, we played together that in your final season at Kintetsu and like myself and even someone like Quaid, we're quite forthright with how we speak as far as what we expect. Mm. But I didn't realize that when you, for example, you, you just say to one of the boys, one of the Japanese boys, like that's not fucking good enough. Like, mm. what's your job makes you here? All they hear is the the the, the fuck, and it's like you're having a go at them. It yeah. becomes personal, and then the message completely gets lost. I've only just learned that that that's a part of their psyche and the way that they think. So it's been that's been quite a difficult adjustment for me. Um, and yeah, that's something that I've had to get used to as far as the mindset and the psyche around that space as well. Yeah, and and they're naturally, you know, they're, they're not used to that front of tone. You know, they're not used to being really growled at, like, and by a peer or something like mm -hmm. that. So, you know, but sometimes it, it is it is necessary too. You know, you can't just go through life. You know, you got to sometimes you got to break a few eggs to make an omelet. So, but yeah, the way you approach things and can be can be really important with the Japanese in terms of mm -hmm. what sort of results you get. What's that been like for you? Because you obviously grew up in New Zealand and, and you probably got sprayed a little bit as a, well, not as a youngster, but, you know, as a teenager and things like that. But you were never in a, well, not for lo not for a long time. You went in a professional environment in New Zealand. Mm. So, I mean, are you sort of, do you feel like you kind of have that Japanese cultural way of dealing with things on the field or at training? Um, probably not. I probably have influences it, but probably not. I think my old man had a lot of influence on me when I was a young fella coming through. And he was more of that... Um, it's uh, old school sort of, yeah. sort of uh, you know, philosophy. <clears throat> um, but then I, I feel like I can sympathise and relate to the Japanese boys reasonably well too. So, yeah. so maybe I've got the best of both, or I've got the worst of both. I don't know. But, <laughs> but uh, yeah, like say compared to say the Tongan boys that come over for high school and university, they would probably be a lot more along the Japanese lines because mm. they've had that ingrained from a lot earlier. So yeah. And after a few years here, you got the call up to the national side. Yep. So JK um, invited us in in 2007. Was that something you wanted to do? Or so once you had those first two years? It was in the back of the mind. I had a mate, I had a good mate um, who was at uh, Senior at the time too. So Philip O'Reilly, Pookie. Mm -hmm. And he'd come over, he came over at 19, I think, and went straight in professional with Senior and, and did the same. And he did the same, didn't go back. And I think that's why they cut the program because they felt like they were losing guys. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, he was playing for Japan and he was like, I mean, he was away doing good tours and playing these test matches. And I was looking at Pooks and, and, and going, shit, they'd be quite keen to do that. Mm. And and then, yeah, so it was it was in the background, but you know, you, you never, you don't want to focus on that. But mm. yeah, it was definitely a, a thought pattern after, after those two years after moving to. And had, like singing the national anthem, you know, playing for Japan, like, do you feel Japanese? You feel a sense of pride, like how? I definitely feel a sense yeah. of pride. I think yeah. you know when you play any game, you're sort of you know you're representing yourself and your, your family yeah. and stuff. So you know, I definitely felt pride playing for Japan, but I probably didn't at the start didn't have as much uh, invested in it as maybe yeah. I did 
you know, after, you know, sort of 16 years. So, mm-hmm. so by the end of it, like it was, you know, it didn't take, it didn't take long. And once you start representing, you, you, you know, you know, started representing Japan, it was pretty, became pretty special. And, and you sort of saw how much it meant to the fans and how yeah. much it meant to the people of Japan. Yeah. And that sort of changed probably you sort of, well, shit, that actually gives it a bit more weight, a bit more significance. Mm. Yeah, especially when they're accepting of you as well. Yeah. You know, they see you as a a Japanese player. Um, Now, if the All Blacks were to play Japan, who are you cheering for? Japan. Are you? Mm -hmm. Great. Good on you. Mm. But then the All Blacks were against anyone else. Even Australia. Oh. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's it's a uh, uh, it's an easy one. <laughs> well, I mean, was there any reservation at all about playing for Japan at that stage? I did. Have, I spoke to my old man about it um, a bit, and just sort of talked it through with him. But he said, "Look, this is the opportunity for you." You know, you, and that was a, it. Was a World Cup year too. Two thousand seven mm-hmm. was a World Cup, so that was a huge draw card as well. You yep. played Japan in that two thousand seven yep. World Cup, didn't you? Yeah, we did. First, yeah, smoke first game. Yeah, we won ninety to three. I think Koss, uh, Koss, Koss was the 10, Koss Iona. He's about 19 years old. Yeah, and we were up, I could have made 40 to nil at this point. They got a penalty and he had a shot for goal. <laughs> and he, <laughs> said, get some he said, I just wanted some points, yeah. He just wanted to get uh, yeah. three points. They knew they weren't going to win, but to get some type of points against yeah. Australia. Well, and that situation that game too was the fact that we played Fiji four days later. Yeah. So yeah. We, oh, the short turnaround. So we had the, Your you know, focus was that game. Like, there was a, quite a few guys that weren't playing in that game. To play versus Fiji, yeah, the, and, and to lose the four days later. So. Who was your coach at the time, John Kerwin? JK. Yeah. And when did um Eddie, Eddie coached you, didn't he? Yeah. So JK was two thousand seven, and then two thousand eleven. Yep. And he took us right through to there, and then Eddie two thousand fifteen. I heard some brutal stories about Eddie when he was coach for you, you guys in twenty. Oh mate, you wouldn't have to in any. In no, any team I, that he's ever been well, with. I heard he took it to a new level with you guys in, that, in the build-up to 2015. And his whole thing there was mental toughness. He wanted to mentally toughen the boys up. Yeah. And he was going to do that through extreme physical training. What and was some of the stuff that he, he took you through? Well, so for a standard day would be 4 o'clock wake up and have your shake and your weigh-in and go down to the gym and have your first training session, whether it be uh, fitness on the bikes or weights or whatever. You're back to... Back to the hotel. So the hotel and the and the was down Miyazaki. I don't know if you guys have been down there. And there's a lovely hotel, and then it's got the ground, sort of a 100 meter walk there. So you just walk back and forth. And the gym's attached to that, like it's sort of an outdoor mm-hmm. tented gym. And so we just walk back to the hotel, have lunch, get ready, go back down, have the first field session of the day, come back three o'clock, and you got to do your recoveries after each session, the pool and ice and that. And then you built in. I think they built in a, like a, a nap time. So every minute of your day was managed down into 30 minute increments for the whole day. And then we're back to down to the field for the afternoon. To late 30 afternoon minute session. increments. Mm-hmm. So what time were you going to bed? Was there bedtime as well? Well, pretty it? much. It's sort of set on the sheet bedtime, but you could, <laughs> most of the boys were in bed like straight after after dinner because they were just back it. They were yeah. And then, yeah, and they were, f- they were long, hour and a half, two hour sessions, full contact, fitness, like and he bro, he put Koss in hospital. Did he? Yeah, heat stroke, Koss collapsed. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it broke it broke plenty of guys. Yeah, but that was his whole thing, and we did it for days and days and days on end. Like we did like thirty days nonstop, without a full day off. Like you might have the day off, but then you come back in for a meeting, or yeah, you know, or a recovery session yeah. or something like that. You know, like so you can never f- officially get away, and it just it just wore blokes blokes down. That two fifteen World Cup, I heard. You hear legends after, you know, you beat South Africa mm. and the reason behind it, Eddie had focused really on South Africa. He said, we're never going to beat them playing normal rugby. Did you, was that true? Is there, there, there truth oh, behind I remember, that? Or? I remember ball and play was, at the time, it was like 32 minutes or something and he wanted to take it to 36. So he'd train us at that, which is funny because then... In what ways? Never kick the ball out? Yeah, so the, actual, the ball in play? Yeah, so that was the whole thing. Beat the box. We used to play this game called Beat the Box. And it was just constant, like playing a game, but you, the ball wasn't allowed to go out. Mm. Or if the ball did go out, he'd set it and he'd just go align it. There was no stopping and you just play and play and play. But any kicking was down the middle. You know, we didn't want any set piece. We mm. wanted to run them off their feet and yep. just, and run and run and run. And and that was just our whole focus. Which was actually quite smart because when you look at how South Africa scored, it was generally off set piece mm. in that mm. game. 
Yeah, and they they made one big mistake I reckon in that game. So they had a penalty close to our line, and they they had their, us under the pump with them all for ages. And they tried them to do a move around the front, and we bailed them to touch. And then they had another penalty, and they took shot at goal. Mm. And we sort of that sort of was a Confidence for me really, you know, yeah. like we're going shit. They they are under the pump here. Mm. They and Eddie had said before, like the closer it is for the longer it is the better chance we'll have because they start thinking. They stop playing and they start thinking that, that shit, we should be in front more. Mm. So that training game beat the box. How long were you doing that in the lead up to the World Cup? Um, we'd been doing it for sort of three months, I suppose. You know, yeah. we'd do, it'd be sort of like a fitness game and, and you know, you're constantly doing it. And it, it, everything you did was just constant running and, and, you know, everything was measured and stuff like that. So We, we have him uh, at Suntory when I was playing there. They had still this Eddie game um, where if you get touched, uh, you hit the deck. If you touch him, you hit the deck. Um, but then you score, the other team gets the ball, they run at you, you hit the deck. Like there's no sense. It's basically you just pick and go for it could be, I don't know, 10 minutes, five minutes. And I'm like, what, what what's the purpose of this? Like why, why are we doing this? What is this for? And they said, I don't know. Like it's for nothing. Like it's just... Eddie does some mind numbing yeah. stuff just to see which guys would tap out, mm. and they're just little tests that he's constantly doing. Um, but it does build resilience, and you know that tough choice. Um, you know they they pride themselves, the Japanese, on making that tough choice. Yeah, and he and he, I think he said it at some stage to someone that he went to the England, and and he couldn't take that same training schedule because the players were just going enough. Fuck that, we're not, not having any bar of that. Yeah. But the Japanese boys wouldn't. They would just yep, bow the head and and just go. They yeah. Wouldn't, they wouldn't. He took that same approach when he was our, our coach at the Reds. I remember some of our sessions, our day would be like, we start at seven, you warm up, and then you'd, you'd do fitness, and then you'd go into 15 v 15 or 10 v 10. You'd play full field, full contact, mm. like 10-minute halves. Then you'd go do a yo-yo test, and then you'd go back to the full field 10 v 10. And, and, and this is brizzy heat. It's like yeah, 35 yeah. degrees and humid. and. Yeah. And you'd think you're done by the end of it. You're absolutely cooked. You're absolutely knackered. And then you'd line up and you'd have to do 300s. Mm. And he'd stagger you from your positional groups. So it'd be props, uh, hookers, second rows, um, all the way back to the back three. You're 10 meters behind each other. And you'd do two. And you'd have to, you, you couldn't allow the guy behind the, the position group behind you to beat you. And if mm. you did, you just kept going. And so we had this one bloke, AJ Gilbert. He literally would just be doing 300s because he would get overtaken every single time. To the point where Eddie's in the middle of the field with his wheel saying, AJ, keep going, mate. Yeah, you keep going, AJ. And AJ would be there for 20 minutes still doing 300s and all us boys are all done. They did the same thing at Suntory with George Smith. He came back. He he used to like the off-season, George. And when he'd come back, <laughs> he was a bit bigger. And they're doing this group. And George, he'll always dig deep and give what he can, but he was just miles behind everyone. Eddie's just blaming. He's going, George, stop. <laughs> Get on the rower, mate. So then George is just rowing in the middle till like everyone was done running. But that's exactly the same thing. Um, but he knew, obviously, George had built up the reputation. Yeah. Like he knew that when game time came, and Eddie was quite smart around that. Like he knew some of the guys that didn't need to be tested a certain way yeah. and other guys that needed to be constantly put on their toes. Yeah. Some some boys hate Eddie. Like, you know, just can't handle the challenge or the way he treats them. But then, look, I, I didn't mind Eddie at all. I loved Eddie. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I did. You got, I feel like I played some of my best rugby under him. And, yeah, I agree. You know, I may not agree with some of the way he treated some guys, but for me, I, yeah, he was good to me and, and you know, every day. Oh, geez, you look younger today, Tommy. Yeah, yeah. You're looking younger, man. <laughs> In front of the boys. Yeah. You're all right, too. And every... And every day, you, you sort of, it's subconscious. Like, it was sort of, oh, mate, no, I'm feeling old today. Eddie, yeah. feeling old. But, you know, Every day you'd say, ah, oh, Tommy, Tommy, you're looking great today. <laughs> and you'd sort of go, oh. And it, I think it's like almost subconsciously buried in your brain because I was, yeah. I was at, that was that was my last World Cup because I was 34 and I was, no chance I was going to play the next one. But, you know, I felt like I was an old man then. Yeah. And But him saying that every day almost, or maybe it almost subconsciously buried in there. So, yeah, I'm, I'm all right. Yeah. Not too bad. <laughs> what was your relationship with Eddie like off the field? Did you have... Much to do with him? Uh, I didn't have a hell of a lot to do with him, to be honest. Like, he, you know, he sort of keeps to himself and, yeah, he sort of, uh, to, to a degree, he does his own thing. Um, you know, he'd been through a lot in those those couple of years with his, with his stroke and then getting himself back up and running. Yeah. I think also, Eddie, I heard recently, like he did an interview, he doesn't like to get too close to players. I think the only player that he's ever, he admitted, getting close to and liked was James Haskell. 
um, for whatever reason. Really? Yeah. Yeah, he said it on, on an interview. Yeah. Um, and I've got exact same similar experience with him. If Eddie walked in here, I'd straighten up and feel like I'm that 19-year-old kid mm. that he recruited. He just has that aura or that presence um, about him. So, yeah, I mean, I totally relate exactly the same. Like, you respect him. He's an amazing coach. And I think for me at the time when I was playing, he got the most out of him, out of me. But from a personal point of view, I don't think we ever really connected in any way, not like I have with other coaches. Mm. Was that? Yeah, no, I definitely agree. Thing? And then, and then Japan's different because it's it's sometimes the foreigners sort of tend to stick a wee bit closer. But but Eddie did did definitely keep himself not isolated, but you know he kept that you know that, that insular sort of barrier between players and the and the coaches a bit. Do you remember that interview that he did with um his post game with the is your skipper sit next to him? after the French barbarians? Yeah, and I did some work like, with him. Yeah, he, like Japanese culture, like that people are just like they're happy, right? They're smiling, they yeah. work all that type of stuff, and he's just sitting there smiling, and yeah. Eddie's like. What are you smiling about, man? It's not funny, mate. <laughs> no, it was a question where they said something because I remember actually talking to him about it. Um, it was a question that uh, Hirose, who was the captain at the time, he got asked something. Yeah. Um, and he just said the hmm, like the yeah. I, like, I can't believe we lost that kind of embarrassed smile. Yeah, well, and it was. I don't think there was any. Well, it wasn't a laugh. Eddie one. just took it though. Right? That's but he wrong. took it that way. That's what's wrong with Japanese rugby, mate. You think it's funny? <laughs> We've just lost, mate. Oh, and then God. it's spot on. But he also, that, that's what made, uh, like, Hiroshi then became famous off the back of that. In Australia, yeah. everyone saw that Eddie's not changed. He's berated his captain in front of, <laughs> in front um, of all the media. In front of everyone. He, he then didn't go to the World Cup in 2015. He missed no, out, didn't no, he? No, he did. He went. He was. He, he wasn't go. the captain. But, but he, he went, was captain at the time. He held quite a lot of, um, not influence, but he had, like, he was a, he's a top man. Great man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he, he was a good player. Um and he could cover sort of wing and first five, but he he went. He had a lot of re- leadership and a lot of of the team culture. You know, he was he sort of set that to a certain degree, yeah. and so he he went and he never played a game, but he yeah. he he was a really important part of that team. Going back to that World Cup, that miracle at Brighton. <laughs> what were the last ten minutes like for you guys on the field? Bloody tiring, <laughs> stuffed. It was actually a really hot day that day. It was mm. really hot. Oh man, it was amazing. It's hard to pick out at the moment or anything but just getting that result and, and we so pushed training back that day yes yeah, so we, we were on the physio we're getting strapped yeah we're strapped getting ready to go and we end up pushing training back because yeah, so the bus is ready so we're not, we're not going we're, we're not leaving so we end up staying there watching the game and make the cheer after from the entire hotel but the entire squad we, we made it was like we were all japanese yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. still gives me goosebumps thank you oh, yeah right now. was there ever a thought to go for three because i think like no. to draw the game no, because Leach you were only behind by three, weren't you? Yeah, yeah. And the Eddie, you see Eddie going, take the shot, take the shot. You were screaming out, take the shot. And Leach, he was. Around. So Eddie wanted the shot. Yeah, Leach turned around and, and he was like, "What do you, what do you reckon?" I said, oh, we're, we're, "We're on here." Like with the scrum earlier, we just pushed them off the ball and they're down a yellow card. I think, mate, we go, we go for it. So we took the took the scrum. Yeah, beat and the box. They, and then they and they brought on a new front row and they only pushed us off the ball. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it was. Huge, huge nuts by Leachy to 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 make that call. Yeah. But, yeah. but then after that, you would have felt like the the difference that you'd made, or actually what that result meant to the whole tournament, but also like back in Japan, the support that you would have received from off the back of that. Unreal. When we got off the bus back at the hotel in Brighton, and there was a thousand people outside the hotel, and we were we'd taken ages to get home. And there was thousands of people, well, thousands of people standing there watching us. And how many were there so, when you left to go to that game? Oh, four or five. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like, it's what about the amazing. reception coming back here? Like, it must have been that must have been incredible as well. Oh, unreal! Coming back and the airport, and we're getting off the planes and stuff like that. And there's, it's like what happens for you know the national soccer team when they do well, or yeah. you know the baseball team when they win the world championship. Like the cameras follow you. There's no one. They've cleared the path, so there's no one else. On the, on the in your way, and as you're walking out, it was quite a long walk. And then there's a camera guy following you. It was all live TV, us getting off the plane and stuff like that. And That's the boys incredible. are hungover as hell. Yeah, <laughs> been boozing all the way home, and coming out of the airport, and there's you know thousands of people at the airport and stuff like that. It was pretty pretty un- unreal considering mm. you know, when we left, there might have been ten or fifteen media there. And did he give you any flack for not going for the three? No. 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 After the game, I told you. <laughs> I knew, I knew, I told the boys. Beat the box, beat yeah. the box. Oh, yeah, that was massive. And then obviously Scotland was the next one. So you you were a chance of making the, 
the quarterfinals. Well, we played Scotland four days later. Yeah. So the boys, Eddie goes like, "What?" We all went back to the hotel, watched the game, and had a few beers yeah. there. And Eddie goes like, "You know, enjoy your night. You don't do this every day." But we were up at training tomorrow morning. Yeah, those ones. Yeah. You do what you want, but we're on yeah, tomorrow. I don't know if any boys slept. You know, like I, my family was there, so I had a few beers, and then I went and slept with the the kids. My baby was, well, my son was you know, three months old. Mm. And uh, so we slept on the floor in their hotel. And uh, and then we just went off the train the next morning. But a few of the boys went out. But they reckon that the we, – you know how you have those security guys with you that are sort of plain clothes security guys that are sort of attached to your team? Yeah. Well, our, our detail went from two to 11 <laughs> overnight. So the boy, a couple of boys went out and, they, and the security guys went – just sort of tucked along behind them. They didn't even know they were there, but they had the old security boys following them around and, yeah. Changed changed everything. Mm. Going back to the the previous World Cup which you played at, which was in New Zealand, what was that like for you as a as a New Zealand born guy? It's interesting because out of the four I've played, that's the one I've probably least enjoyed. Yeah, um, and that's probably more because of the results. Uh, you know, we, we went into that one, we went into that one on a real high, like we'd won the Pacific Nations, we were expecting to do well, we had, you know, sort of high, you know, higher expectations of ourselves, and we went in and we played France first up, lost, but played played a solid game, lost in the last sort of 10 or 15, they scored yeah. a couple of tries. And we played, then we played the All Blacks, and it was again a short turnaround against the All Blacks, and we got thumped. But then our next two games were Tonga and, and in Canada, and that was like, we hadn't lost to Tonga in sort of three or four years, we thought this was going to be our chance, we had Won a game in the World Cup and and we got out physically played and then we drew with Canada so it was a real it was a real finished like on a downer um, yeah the actual environment being here in New Zealand and family and stuff was awesome but the results sort of you know left a bit of sour taste in the mouth yeah um, and we came home pretty deflated and then the the head of the JRFU then went out and blamed the foreigners and the team for for the poor results and so they don't have a Japanese heart. Stuff like that, and I said, no, stuff that I'm, I'm done with Japan rugby. Mm. I'm retired. I'm 30, 31, whatever, and, and that'll do me. And uh, no, I, don't, I don't want to play for people that are not going to have my back. Yeah. In those such situations. So, um, in terms of, in terms of that, like it was, the results I think made it the, the hardest one to enjoy. How's that facing the Haka or facing New Zealand for the first time as a Kiwi? Do you really want to show them that potentially you could have? Oh, Being an all black, yeah, and, shit, yeah, yeah, hundred percent. And facing but, the hucker though, is it what? What's the emotions like? Uh, um, I think because you face a lot of huckers, yeah, and so it, you know, you, and it's no different. It's no different. Like you know, I've faced the New Zealand Maoris a few times, and the, you know, the, even you know, the, the the Tongans and the yeah. Samoans and they, the, you know, the Fijians of the Sivitao and the, and, mm. and all that. So I take good motivation from it. I think it's I enjoy it. Yeah, I think yeah, cool. Did you sing the New Zealand? Well, in your head, even the national. I anthem? did actually. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I did. But I even there's a point after a while that you start to hum the words myself, even being an Aussie because you, you you know it. You know how to um, hum. You start like, I always I, I always do that with a South African anthem, just because I, I like 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 their anthem. But then you realise you better switch back into <laughs> worrying about like your own anthem and playing. Yeah, I always got a, had a thing where when we're doing the anthems, try and find the family. So I always used yep. to look and try and find them in the crowd. So that was my, I don't know. If, and that was during the opposition's anthem. That, that was my thing to try and just make sure they're there or I don't know. Was just it, give you something yeah. to focus on yeah, as well yeah. during that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. But you, did you sing along out loud? Nah. No, you couldn't do that. Don't Imagine think the so. the camera gets on you. Yeah. <laughs> I don't like think so. But, for them. but it's not something you, you don't hide it. Like it's, yeah. you know, you still have respect. And, and I thought, I can't, I don't think I did sing out loud, but um, I definitely was singing in my head. In 2011, 2015, uh, after that win in Brighton, as you said, sort of pumped up everything Japan did. Is that when you saw sort of quite a big change here? In terms of the... The rugby the, support? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, and you see kids out playing in the park and they'd be doing this one, you know, the Goromaru yeah, Goromaru, kicking. Yeah. And, and, you know, he, he blew up, like rugby players became actual stars, you know, Leachy and Goromaru, like these guys were were massive, massive news and, and genuine, you know, media. Yeah. Uh, personalities and stuff so that was it was pretty cool to see and, and it definitely pumped up rugby in terms of viewership and awareness and 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 numbers I think so 
Not too long, we'd sign Guru Murray. And there were times when the media would reach out and they'd say, is he playing this week? Uh, and they said, oh, he might be on the bench. So there'd be 12 cameras turning up that would be on the side just filming him sitting on the bench. Some games he wouldn't even get on. Yeah. But, like, that's when I was like, well, this guy is, like, it's almost like the Justin Bieber of Japan. And then when we played um, when we played Yamaha here, I went to catch up with him after the game and there is just lines of people waiting, like everyone basically in the stadium was in a line waiting to sign for him. Yeah. So I ended up just brushing him and walking off. But <laughs> like you just you couldn't believe the impact that one game. Like he kicked well, had he kicked poorly that game, but the one game where they beat South Africa, he's kicked well, he did his role super well and he's just become that, that, a superstar off the back of it. That World Cup was the best rugby he played. Yeah. Ever. Like and then you know, we played uh, Scotland, he made a pretty cool Cover, covering tackle and then he kicked well and yep. he just just played good solid rugby and, and you know, well great rag, great rugby but it yep. just changed his whole life I think yeah it had, really it was life changing especially for yeah. him I mean I imagine it was for a, a lot of other people but not for him he's still he's the man like yeah. he is like living off that almost like Johnny's drop goal mm. like yeah. it's a similar experience mm. yeah no definitely what were those? I mean, Michael Leach. I imagine you you know pretty well. How did they handle that that change and suddenly the attention they received? I think it was still manageable in 2015. I think that was still like was sort of there for a wee bit. And then Gautamaru might have been more full on. You know, he he signed with a big media company and he was you know, yeah. doing watch ads and all this sort of stuff. But the rest, everyone else, sort of like just sort of carried back on. And yeah. there was you know there was. There's public awareness, but there wasn't the fan status that maybe some had. Leachy maybe had wee bit, but it wasn't until 2019, yeah. and that, that's when that that just went next level. Yeah, and the crowds at mm. games too. They yep. were sold out. Everything was sold out after that. Mm. Whereas beforehand, um, before that World Cup, any Suntory game, I'm warming up and there's about, I don't know, 1,800 people there. You're thinking, oh, this is this can be tough to get up for. And then after the World Cup, you've got sold stadiums mm. and actually feels like, like, even at that point for me, I really felt the like the impact of a successful World Cup, like in Japan, yeah. it, it just became mm. huge. Like someone like Matsushima, mm. he became like the new Goromari. Like yep. they're life changing events when you can go well at a World Cup because Japan's population and their interest in. People when they're famous just grows massively. The Scotland Japan Scotland game was one of the most watched games ever. And the in the in two thousand fifteen World Cup, because we'd beaten South Africa and the next game yeah. was Scotland and so there was like twenty odd, forty odd million people watching the, the game just in Japan alone. Well, Greg Greg Laidlaw was telling us yeah, he, yeah, said yeah, he, yeah. Became he became off famous off the back of that. Yeah. So he, he walks around and was like Mr. Greg, Mr. Greg yeah. everywhere because the the amount of viewers obviously after you guys had just beaten South Africa. Mm -hmm. But obviously, off the back of that successful World Cup, um, as you said, more more spotlight, more attention to the game here. I, I guess the influence off the back of that was the 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 competition getting a bit more attention. You had more foreign players coming. That's obviously lifted the level. And then the Rugby World Cup in twenty nineteen, Japan has gotten even better. Yeah. Um, have you have you seen that continued progression since then? More foreign influence, more coaches, players, the competition getting better and better. Yeah, the competition's definitely grown, and we talked about you know. 2015 earlier, the competition sort of changing, but you know, the physicality of the competition now is, is so much more than, you know, I think it's reaching that sort of, yeah, the yeah. top teams are definitely at that mm. super sort of level. Mm -hmm. and the physicality and the, you know, and the, the structure and the and the way they're playing, because you, know, you look at the guys that are playing, like there's some amazing talented guys out there, like <coughs> it's unreal. And so how do you find that balance? Because there's obviously the, the, the conversation around the, the the quality of the competition improves because you bring foreign players mm. in. And a lot of foreign players are now coming over younger, like mm. Richie Mwanga and, and Bowden Barrett and, and those types of players. Yeah. But then how do you find the balance to then make sure that those Japanese players are still getting improvement? It's a, it's a bloody hard one because, you know, the teams are going to do what they can to win. And that's mm. you don't take that away. You don't blame them for that. That's what it's, what it's all about. Um, I think from the JRFU point of view, they might have to tweak the rules a wee bit. It sounds a bit hypocritical coming from me, but I want to see the Japanese boys mm. at least have a chance coming out of uni and getting that experience and being able to play. Whereas, you know, I think that is it's moving slightly in the wrong direction at the moment. I suppose what makes your story so you're talking about it sounds like you're hypocritical, but the good thing with you is you see yourself as Japanese. Like you're doing it for the right reasons. 
you're not just there to get a cap, get your cash, and then and then get out. You're actually fully invested and fully committed. It's a bit. Well, I, don't, I can't speak to how it is now. So I've been out of the out of the team for a while, but. Um, the Japan national side, you don't make money. You lose money playing for them because you don't get you don't get like we used to get paid fifteen hundred yen a day. That was our that was our pay. So what's that? What's that? To 20, 20, 20 bucks. Twenty dollars yeah. a day, and it was twenty five dollars if you were overseas. And you got a bonus if you won against a tier one nation. <laughs> you ain't beating many tier one nations, you know, like that. So. Yeah, so they don't have much payment. Well, they didn't have much payments back no, in the day. None of that. But then, were yeah, you getting paid by your club when you're but away? You're still getting paid yeah. by your club. So you're. So you're basically owned by your club, mm. and the and the union would pay the club a rental fee, which was minimal. And some clubs would give that to the player, yep. but most wouldn't. And if your family came to a game or came to watch, like, and I've always wanted my family to come, so I'd always try and get them. It was costing you thousands. Like, mm. uh, end of 2015, Eddie Jones finished up with you guys. Were you sad to see him go? It didn't matter for me because I retired. Yeah. And I've done that about four times, but... Yeah. <laughs> But um, I think he'd I think he'd run his run his race. He'd done what he came to do. And we were talking earlier about how, you know, time under Eddie, you, you can't do. It's not sustainable long term. Mm. Yeah. You know, Eddie is so intense and so he squeezes the best out of you, and then you're done. And so many boys retire after that sort of um, effort. And then yeah. And so him to move on, I think it would probably worked well. I think it was good for him, you know, because he's done that three, won three games at a World Cup, um, and, but not qualify for the quarters has never been done before. Japan, the best ever performance, you know, he could only really go backwards from there unless he yeah. made the quarterfinals. Not only go back, but, you know, the, the so for him to move on to the next gig and it was probably good timing. Yeah. Um, but he, he, he'll never be lost to Japan rugby. He's always, you know, Suntory. Oh, he still gets his invoice in. He still gets a clip in for mm, Suntory. Oh, no, no but he's also like, but he's adding value. Yeah, he he actually like he comes for the right reasons. Like he actually wants to make a difference, help with the game plan. I think no matter what team he's involved with, yeah, you know, it could have been England or even when he was coach at England, he would text me about games and things that we're doing with some Tory. So he still watches mm. the game. So it's not like he's just getting his clip. He um, like he properly loves rugby. He's fully invested in it. But I agree. Like there's a there's a limit when you've had him for so long. You're trying to please him. Trying to please him. You, you can never please him. Mm. It's almost like if you had a 10 out of 10 game, he'd say, yeah, it's how you play. I said, oh, maybe I could have done this better. Exactly, mate. <laughs> but, but you actually don't believe that. You're just saying it just, just to make... Saying, uh, you don't want to be... Yeah. I, was, I, was, man, I, was I was good today. I was awesome. Yeah. I was a world class. Yeah. He, um, yeah. He's a tough man to please and that becomes exhausting over a really long periods of yeah. time. I think he said now that he's mellowed out a little bit. Does he? Well, he, he said, he said, <laughs> he said, I've learnt, mate, from players. Like, oh, it's easier. But I, uh, I'm, I don't know. You need to ask the players. Yeah. It'll be it'll be interesting how the, the Aussies go under this because well, we're talking five five years is his next gig. So. Yeah. He's got that aura around him mm. where players want to please him. Yeah. You're even saying yourself, you you text him and... Well, he messaged me like after we played you guys the first game, the, yeah. the D-Rocks, and yeah. it was three in the morning. And I woke up at six and he goes, well played on Sunday. And I said to Gitz, I was like, I looked over my shoulder because I just... You, you get this thing where you feel like you're 18 years... Because I first met him when I was 18, like yeah. this kid again going like... But you also felt good. You're like, oh, I impressed Yeah, Eddie. like that, yeah. that's the thing. And like, you've got no coach. relationship with him. No. This is the type of like coach yeah, that he is though, you know? Like you play well... He's not going to pick you for whatever the Wallabies or whatever, but he sends you a nice text. You yeah. go, oh, I feel all right. I went and watched, I went and, I went and watched the game and I was like, oh, I went all right here. I don't know, <laughs> not too bad. Why. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What was the relationship like from the outside between Michael Leach and Eddie? It was pretty full on. Eddie really put a lot of pressure on Leachy. Yeah. Um, and, but he probably, Leachy probably learned a lot and grew a lot and from that too. And Leachy's grown so much as a, as a player. Shit, I remember when he first came into the squad, he was just wee. It wasn't that wee, but he was a young Fijian boy. You know, he'd spend most of the time sleeping in his room if he wasn't training, you know, and he wouldn't say boo. And, and he's grown into this a most amazing leader and respected man. Like, it's, it's an amazing story to see. You mentioned uh, just before you retired after the 2015 World yep. Cup. Was that your first retirement? No, well, I, after 2011, I sort of said, no, yeah. I'm done. And, and, and then Eddie came to us after a year or so and said, oh, you know, why don't you come to a camp and see how you like it? And... You know, we'd, we're keen to have you involved, so I went along and I went. I didn't play again for Japan. I, I played for one game. Um, we 
Japan were playing Ireland in 2017. I had been out for about six months, just had an op in pre-season, and we'd had a game for Kintetsu. Pre-season game was my, I played 40 minutes. It was my first game in about six months, and uh, was on the train home and got a call from Jamie saying, uh, you know, we've had a, you know, had a few injuries. What are you doing next weekend? And um, and I had a few drinks and said, oh yeah, I'd be keen. <laughs> It's sort of it's, it's a problem, yeah. 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 And I get talked into things, and um, so I went. I got home, and then I sort of sobered up, and went, holy shit, what have I just signed up for? <laughs> and went for camp, and I thought they might just chuck me on the bench, but ended up starting. And then the other lot got injured after about twenty minutes, so I ended up playing eighty minutes in about thirty-five degree heat versus Ireland. And I was, and afterwards I was cooked. It, was, it took me about two months to recover. From, you, know, <laughs> you know how if you do mm. one of those, you just just cooks you. Um, so, yeah, done after that. And then I was having a few beers. Here we <laughs> and, um, there it is. I was up in, uh, we're on holiday up in, um, in Picton, which is the top of the South Island there in New Zealand. And um, I was sitting around with a couple of mates and I got a text from Brownie. We're having a few beers and, and he goes, oh, a few injuries on the Sunwalks. Um, if you're keen to come and play, see if you're still up to playing at that level, maybe it might lead into something else. I was like, nah, nah, this is no good. And it was quite funny sitting there with those boys and uh, my mates since, so, you know, the kids. And um, and they were like, well, why wouldn't you? Like this, And I was sort of ready to throw it away. And they sort of made me realise that how the opportunity that he'd just offered would, is something that doesn't come along every day to any, any person. Mm. And I was like, oh, maybe this would, could be good. And and so I texted him back and said, oh, yeah, it could be keen. And, and uh, yeah, went from there and played for the Sunnies and, and then got called in back into the Japan squad. How was that playing for the Sun Wars? It was awesome. Yeah, loved it. Like it was, shit, we covered some miles. Like yeah. flying from place to place. But oh, what a great environment! Um, great bunch of boys. Yeah, always the underdog. Were they mainly foreigners? The team, or did you 50, have 50? Um It was. Yeah, it was. It was awesome. Yeah, nice. Mm. Was there much buy-in from like a fan perspective to the Sun Wars? I think there was by the end. I think there was a really cool like. Uh, they sort of created their own. It was, and you know how you go to a Japanese rugby game quite often. It's quite quiet and, mm. and stuff like. That. They had the towels gun and they're all howling <laughs> and stuff like that. And it was good crowds. Yeah. Like, mm. And there was the I only played the last season, but the, yeah, it, it felt like there was mm. pretty good um, buy-in from the from the fans and stuff like that. Like, is there, is there a way that you can see either the Sunwolves coming back or potentially, like I said, your top two teams maybe being a part of Super? What's what's an ideal way that that could possibly look? I would say that they're going to have to involve Japan somehow. I think the money's just too big mm. and the viewership and the numbers are just too big to keep them on the outside. But, you know, I think it would be good for Japanese rugby to have that next level, that next level in terms of development for Japanese players. Mm. Um, but, it's yeah, it's definitely, like you say, it's definitely the, the, the Super Rugby competition probably needs Japan more in terms of money, in terms of that viewership and that... What were Tony Brown and, and Jamie Joseph like as coaches? Good, really good. They took Japan to the next level, and that was that was probably really hard to look like you've been a success as a coach. You, they had to get to the quarterfinals. Mm. So how did they do that? Well, they had to basically redefine expectations. You know, Eddie had done it, and he'd sort of thought, well, it's not good enough just to play and, and compete. You have to win. But, you know, the, the expectations had to change. And then so the Jamie and Brownie had to do that again. They had to say, well, it's not good enough just to play well and, and win a few games. We have to make the quarterfinals. And so they did that by measuring a lot of stuff. So everything we did was measured in terms of your fitness, your your weights, your, you know, everything we did was measured and calculated and say, well, this is, we're building towards uh, this. We want to be able to play. And we talked about ball and play. Well, they, they targeted 42 minutes. And so at that time, good God. so we would train um, play 15 on 15 and would be live GPS and um, ball and play would be measured and we'd go for 42 minutes which would take maybe an hour or something like that and it would be mm. pretty much full contact or good solid shoulder on you train like that you yeah. train to get the 42 minutes yeah. ball and play time so that I we feel could play. like in Japan though you need to train how you want to play you can't just like for the Japanese players they need to experience it at training first mm. to mm. then be able to implement it 
Um, yeah, I, I, I yeah, get that. But good God, like 42 minutes and you're doing that in training. Yeah. But I mean, you guys were unbelievable. So it's obviously in 2019. Yeah, and, and then you could see, so we were playing Ireland, that, just that ability to ruck and run and to play and to yeah. play. And to, you know, Is that when you reckon the belief for you? Because you talk about making a quarterfinal, that's great. It's easy to say it. Mm. But the actual belief, it must have been huge after you were able to beat Ireland. Oh, huge. And we sort of had it in the back of our minds. Maybe maybe we're good enough, but sometimes you never really, really, truly believe until you feel it out there in the game. And that game, we felt it. And yeah. the boys believed in what they were doing, I think, was, was more important. So they believed that they were the fittest team in the world. Mm. Yeah. Because... You know, the trainers have showed us you're the fittest team in the world because of this and yeah. because of that. What you can see it here, not just it's not just a pie in the sky thing. Oh, you yeah. guys are really fit. And then Brand is an amazing coach to play for. He's you want to you want to play from. You know, you have those yeah, coaches. Yeah. You want to do well from. You want to play from. And Brand is one of those guys. He relates really well to the team and the players. And and so he made us believe that the game plan we were going to do was going to work. You know, he's he just has that that aura about him. And then Jamie had this whole thing about the physicality to be able to compete we had to be physical so we'd done an enormous amount of physical contact training like double tackles you know just constant contact building that contact strength that contact ability and we had David Kidwell come in and do you know a bit of work with us for defense and stuff like that so you know that that was the sort of the the parts to the jigsaw that they put together to create that belief but to actually feel it on the field in that in that island game and come together like that they reinforced that and made that sort of you know actual physically available you know physically you know you experienced it mm. and then the scotland week that was a weird one because you there were floods or yeah the typhoon, 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 came, typhoon through. came through yeah yeah so they were going to call the game and then scotland they they gave us all the motivation we needed because they were saying, and did you want it called off like no. because you got like you would have gone japan would have gone through yeah we would have gone through but you everyone wanted to play yeah 100 percent. yeah and and it motivated us so much that they were bitching so much about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, and I, every now and again, I give Greg a wee, yeah, 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 just a wee wink. Don't need to say anything. Just yeah, a wee, he knows. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, they were saying, oh, you know, this is unfair. We're going, we need to play this game, and they were going to sue and all this sort of stuff mm. because the game. And so when it was played, and and there was like ninety thousand people there, and it was just an un, unreal atmosphere, and yeah, it was so cool. You guys got a lot of support during that tournament. How, mm. how good were the crowds? Oh, amazing. They were they were fantastic, you know, and and the buy-in from Japanese people in terms of the public and you know how positive like World Cups are always have a different vibe to them. They always yeah. I've always found that's just so positive and and then you go to the game and the, you get there to warm up before Ireland or before Scotland, and there was like you know thirty thousand people in the stadium already, and there was just a buzz. Mm. There was just a hum in the stadium. It was just yeah, you know, it just got you up like it was. Hard to explain, but it was really cool. Yeah, I remember how welcoming people were when when you stayed in the local local communities. We stayed at Ottawa, hmm. and we had all this ceremony where all these kids came out and welcomed us and gave us gifts and wrote us letters to individual players. Like yeah. they write your name, thank you for coming to Ottawa. Like um, we know you're a halfback and things like that. And like it just it gave you like an emotional investment and attachment to the people of that place, but just the country in general. Hmm. I just remember feeling like it was they were so welcoming, so kind and. Made the tournament all that more special, I feel. Yeah, on that, like, after trainings, we'd have, like, a couple of fans that would turn up, Suntory. Obviously, I didn't play in the World Cup, 219, but at Suntory, they'd come and, you know, they just bring random gifts. Mm. They're super friendly. they just come each time. Someone might turn up with a Starbucks gift card for me. Here you go. You can go get a coffee. Is there anything, any weird one? Like, you've been here a long time. You must have got... Some strange gifts. Mate, I've never seen anyone get as many gifts as him in my one year at Kintetsu. Not even training. Like, at his house, people will rock up and leave stuff at his doorstep. <laughs> and, like, we'd be out walking around and... You oh, should leave a grocery list son, out. Son, and they just give him... I'm like, what is going on here? Well, he deserves it. He yeah, 100%. 100%. It. 100% <laughs> but, I'd, but, I'd, but I'd never experienced it. Japanese people are very generous. Very. Uh, very, very amazingly generous. Um, and we had some, some local people that would just uh, come around and give vegetables. Like, you know... Put yeah, vegetables that's, at the back door, right. like you sit, come home and there's a big daikon sitting on your back doorstep. You go, oh, cool. Um, been there, or they just rock around with some takoyaki, or which is like uh, octopus balls. Oh, all right. Yeah, and they'd just be, you know, just octopus like, nuts. How, how do they go? No, ball. <laughs> oh, balls of octopus. Yeah. Gotcha. I thought, <laughs> I didn't even know if they had nuts, did they? <laughs> we can cut that out. No, we're not, we're, <laughs> we're not cutting good. that that's out. We're, we're keeping that. Yeah. We're keeping that. No, it's actually little bits of octopus inside a batter that's made yeah. into. Um, that's what I thought. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
octopus nuts. <laughs> well, you never know. <laughs> Mate, there's some strange stuff that you eat over here. <laughs> oh, that's all time. Do you get any sort of homemade kind of, not food items, but sort of photos or little... Um, oh, yeah. Um, people just, you know, they, they give me photos of myself. Like... Yeah, that's like, strange. It's, yeah, it's yeah. kind of weird. Well, if you do the one where they, they can I get a photo and you go, yeah. And then they just go. They just take a photo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the worst. You don't. You don't want to be in the photo. No, yeah. I don't want to be in the photo. But yeah, I mean, beautiful like um, t-shirts. They've made some random t-shirts with for all the family with different colors and and little patterns and stuff on them. Um, yeah, message boards. You know, like with writing big framed message boards that they've done. You know, photos, pictures, and letters, and or little handcrafts, like little things that would go on your phone. You know, like little oh, yeah. beads and yeah. Well, you put it on the phone, and then as soon as they leave, you, I better get that off. Yeah. What about you? What's the strangest one you've got? Um, yeah, you would have got some weird shit, wouldn't you? Yeah, you got some weird stuff, but they're unbelievably thoughtful. Like, they'll find out what your kids like. Like yeah. my, my son, like I went last time I came here a few months ago. My kids like the popping candy, mm. um, and I just put on Twitter, "How do you find this?" I got that many replies. I met a lady that walked me ten minutes to find it. <laughs> that was just random. But then at the airport. I don't know how this fan knew when I was flying out, what time, but he was at the airport waiting and gave me another bag of popping candy. Yeah. Like, mate, they're yeah, unbelievably unbelievable. thoughtful. We did it after two two nineteen World Cup. We did a um, TV mm. a TV show, and they said, "Oh, what are you going to do?" You know, and I said, "Oh, I'm going to." I promised my my daughter who loves uh, she loves pandas, and there's a place in Wakayama, and they have pandas there. So we we went to the thing, and and they gave us a. Um, They'd sort of seen the TV show, and so they gave us a free pass and took us back to the feed the pandas by hand and stuff like that, which was amazing. But then people had seen the TV show. So on that last game, I don't know if you remember, people would throw pandas after the after the game, after the last couple of games, we sort of did a lap around the field, and they would throw toy pandas onto the field for my for my daughters. <laughs> well, I, I don't know. At home, crazy. we've still got like all these like pandas. Yeah. Like little... little uh, Toys and big soft toys and stuff like pandas. Wish I'd thrown me Kit Kats. <laughs> yeah. You said, I love, uh, I love Yen. Did you get any celebrity status after that 2019 World Cup? No, not really. That's not true. He's not telling the truth. Yeah, from what we were telling. He's literally you. ran the entire Osaka city. So anywhere you go, they'd be giving him gifts on the street. Thomas-san, picture. <laughs> and we'd be standing there taking photos of him yeah. and everything. Yeah, will you hold the camera? Yeah, hold, <laughs> you hold my grocery bags while I say photo this bloke. It, sure. it, it, it definitely changed life. So we'd never experienced anything like that. So you know, we'd you'd go you'd go places where you wouldn't have, you'd usually just go and you'd go to Grand Front. We'd go to places there, shopping malls and and you'd be walking along and then all of a sudden you'd have a line of people mm. wanting a photo and the and the family would like for a start would just sort of wait and then and then they just eventually they just sort of as soon as it started happening they just bugger off and go and I'd have to try and find them and catch up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, it, and people would come. You'd see people coming around. They sort of found out where you lived and sort of started biking around. But it was not from talking to Leachy, It was nowhere near as bad as it was for him. Like he couldn't leave the house pretty much. You'd stand out a little bit as well with your height. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You sort of you you hard to you don't blend in as much as. Nothing ever dangerous though. It's no, just like no, they just more they they want a photo or they, yeah, they just wanted to get an autograph or you know, whatever. Yeah, no. yeah. And and you retired again after that World Cup. Yeah, I played. We played uh, the club season straight after the World Cup, and then I retired from rugby, and that was beginning in, just before COVID hit. Actually, and went home, and and that was yeah, that was me. I was done. Two of those beers. Two of those had, beers. Yeah, two had a couple of beers. Yeah, and so we came back. It was it wasn't a full time gig, so it was it was doable in that sense. We could still do the farm. I got an old fella down the road that sort of helped out in the low season, and yeah, sort of just it just sort of worked. Yeah. So that's what's next. Farm. Yep. Back home. Yep. You love farming. I love it, mate. I yeah. enjoy the outdoors. I, you know, people always ask you, do you want to coach or do something like that, and then maybe, but I can't. Don't want to commit to that sort of the amount of time and the amount of footy watching you have to do. Like yeah. those guys that watch so much screen time, like they're just watching rugby all the time. And so that sort of doesn't spin my wheels at the moment. I'm keen to, I'm actually coaching under eight soccer. Yeah. <laughs> Young fellas playing you soccer. Uh, first season we lost every game, yeah. but we're slowly improving. Yeah. yeah. But no, it's it's cool, you know, being able to spend that time with the family and watch them grow up and, 
around their grandparents, which is one of the big draw cards to be home. You know, you guys know living away, you yeah. miss the family side of things and the kids with their grandparents. And yeah, so it's yeah, nice lifestyle and good rural lifestyle. And yeah. All right, guys, that uh, I think that takes us to an end for today. Well, we? But um, good to have you here again, yeah, as thanks always. Tom. And thanks, Tom. Thanks, Tom. Appreciate thanks, you guys. joining us. It's been a real pleasure.